Thanks for being here. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you for thanking me. Glad to be here. <laughs> it's nice to see you too. <laughs> so uh, the reason I'm trying to cram in two classes per class is because the other teacher here, the uh, one of the other teachers here, uh, Lama John Stilwell, has just is just finishing course <coughs> 12, uh, the third chapter of the Bodhisattva Charavatar, the, the Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. That took nearly a year of study with a bunch of students, and I'm going to his class. It happens here every Tuesday. That's finishing. The 13th course, the Good Luck course in the ACI uh, courses, is a really difficult course on logic and debating. Yeah, it's actually the underpinning foundation of how you prove stuff. It's difficult, and so John, conveniently, uh, asked one of his teachers to teach it. And Eva is an amazing, holy creature, and she's only in New York for the summer for a short time. So we're not. I'm not teaching Thursdays when they are teaching that course 13. So I want to be done and finished by July 18th. I want to have everything done and finished by July 18th. And then in between that, we have July 4th, which means nobody does anything here in America. Yeah? Rest of the world, we still do stuff. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Um, so I, you should still come on Thursdays, because if you come to listen to, to Course 13, uh, it's going to blow your mind. Yeah. Oh, we can come. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, for political correctness, thank you, Clive. I didn't correctly quote. No, I didn't exactly quote. Yeah, that um, I was paraphrasing uh, what was said in the sutra. But I would love to read you the part in the sutra where uh, the Buddha answers Subhuti. Yeah. So you have in your mind stream the perfect. Answer. The other thing that I want to do, and I showed Clive before, is I'd like to do a verbal transmission of the entire sutra done in this really beautiful musical way. Yeah? So you'll hear me talking like this, the sabuti, what should I say? And the answer will be thus. And that would last for an hour, and we'll have an instrument, and you should just close your eyes and take it in. Yeah? And that would be on the end where we'll transmit the entire thing because you will then have the karmas awakened to connect meaning to their sentence. When the Buddha starts saying, and think of being born from an egg, you know now what that is, and born from a this, and whereas before you wouldn't, right? So that's happening around the 18th of July. But, um, <coughs> Subhuti, this is how those beings who have entered well into the way of Bodhisattva must think to themselves as they feel the wish to achieve enlightenment. I will bring to Nirvana the total amount of living beings, every single num uh, one numbered among the ranks of living beings, those who were born from eggs, those who were born from womb, those who were born through warmth and moisture, those who were born miraculously, those who have physical form, those without one, with none, those with conception, those with none those with neither conception nor with none. No conception. However many, live, however many living beings there are in whatever realms there may be, anyone at all labeled with the name of living being, all these will I bring to total nirvana, to the sphere beyond all grief, where none of the parts of a suffering person are left at all. Yet even if I do manage to bring this limitless number of living beings to total nirvana, there will be no living being at all who was brought to their total nirvana. Why? The Buddha says. Because, Subhuti, if a bodhisattva were to slip into conceiving of someone as a living being, then we would never call them a bodhisattva. Wow. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> yeah? So, but that's not, I have to explain what that means, I have to explain so much, and I'm going to give it a go. I don't, I don't think I have the full understanding, so I'm going to give you the understanding that I have, and the sniff of the trail of where I think it goes. I think I have that. I think I've smelt where it goes, 
but I don't think my mind's uh, connected. Yeah. So I've heard it from my lamas. I heard it from my teachers. It was explained that it's a different thing to know it. Yeah. What I'm saying to you is, I hope you sniff where to go. Um, first thing I want to talk about is that he's talking about bodhicitta, right? So I'm going to talk about two kinds of bodhicitta. And that should be the next. This is Kunzo Senkye and Dundam Senkye. So Kunzo means deceptive or false. <coughs> and Dundam means ultimate. So far, in all the ACR courses we have, we've talked really about the deceptive bodhicitta. We talked about bodhicitta as the wish for total enlightenment for the sake of every living being. But the Buddha just said, well, if you're thinking about getting anybody there, nobody will get there. So this is a thing. He's here alluding to these two forms of uh, semkhya, or bodhicitta. Would you say a bodhisattva has a perception of relative truth or ultimate truth? Relative reality or ultimate reality? Both. 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 Seeing and labeling all these living beings as living beings, would they be in an ultimate reality? No. no. How do you know that? So do do you need to have seen emptiness directly to know how to love humans, beings? No. 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 Right. So having a state of mind of bodhicitta. Having a wish to reach total enlightenment, meaning you're not there yet, right? For the sake of others, doesn't necessarily mean that you have seen emptiness directly. Now, could there be bodhisattvas who have seen emptiness directly? Yes. yes. Okay. So, so he's he's sort of playing with subhuti, I think, where he's saying, if you're thinking of those kind of beings independent to your perception, the relative beings who will somehow be saved by all your actions, no one's getting there. None of, they don't exist the way you think they exist. They can't be there because they're non-existent beings. We wouldn't call you a bodhisattva then. <laughs> He's saying you should think of them in this way and know that nobody's getting there. So he's alluding to the this is hard to think about, okay? So your mind will be placed in difficult spaces. It's placed your mind in a difficult space to explain it. The answer from the Buddha to Subhuti included both the deceptive and ultimate experience. He said, you should take them to Nirvana. That's how you should think. But if you think that you're taking them to nobody's getting to Nirvana, he's saying, about ultimate bodhicitta there. And so I need to explain to you that there's relative bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta. Have you heard of ultimate bodhicitta? Yes. Hmm? What is ultimate bodhicitta? Dundam Senke. Senke. Connected to wisdom? Um, is that the profession? When you uh, realize the pendant arising, Isn't it bodhicitta, you see everything is alright? Is that true? Ultimate bodhicitta is a code name. Let me just tell you because it's 9 o'clock. Ultimate bodhicitta is, is a code name or a secret <coughs> name for the direct perception of emptiness. Only that. So you have relative bodhicitta, which is the wish for alignment for the sake of every living being. Are you in a state of ultimate reality when you're having a wish? So there's two parts to bodhicitta, no. yeah? yeah? The wish that you get to 
put a hood for the sake of everyone else. There's two thoughts going on there. Good. But you can have the perception of emptiness without having a motivation. Correct. Mm -hmm. If you see that it's empty, then it's okay the way it is. Is he asking, is he saying that you have to get yourself there first? Yeah, that, I think that's the, uh, a, good, a good way to sum her up. But yeah, thank you. Because um, he's saying to you, which of those two ways, the relative bodhicitta or the ultimate bodhicitta, do you think he's trying to get you to by saying, you know, if you're thinking of that nobody's going to, when you, everyone gets there, nobody really gets there, which of the two is he thinking? There's nobody to get there. Yeah. Nobody outside of you. <laughs> With the ultimate called bodhicitta, there is no discrimination because ultimately it, he's seeing emptiness. And in emptiness, there is no discrimination. So there is no self and there is no other. So there are no other beings that are not the self. It's just a, I hate to use the word oneness, but there is not a separation. It's not a two, it's not not two. Yeah. Better way to phrase it. And, and so the experience is there's no difference between that mind and all other beings. You can't have a perception of other beings in the direct perception of in the ultimate bodhicitta. You, it's impossible. Because as soon as you do, you're in relative truth. When, when Buddha was first awakened, what his first words were, I, when speaking of the, the morning star, I and all beings have now awakened. Yeah. Well, that was the same thing. Everybody conventionally get awakened, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have Buddhism. Yeah. But in that mind of his, that Dharmakaya, everything was. Everything was awake, exactly. So he's saying to Subhuti, you know, and, and to us who are listening to the Sutra, if you think you're really going to help somebody, really change all those innumerable beings, you're not taking anybody. It's also placing your mind in that ultimate body cheater. It's imbuing all of your actions. Correct. Thank you. So that's the one he's asking you. And to understand the ultimate bodhicitta, we need to talk about what emptiness is empty of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know we've done a little bit of this, but each time we do this, particularly in the sutra, we're going to get a little bit deeper. Now, I'm going to be challenged because we have assumptions about how we operate together, and I'm going to break some of those assumptions with you. Meaning I, I have to appear to you to know more than what you think I know. <laughs> and I, you have to appear to me to be learning more than what you learned. <laughs> and we together need to appear to each other as I can use that information somehow to turn me on in a way that I wasn't turned on before. Does that make sense at all? That's what I'm trying to do here. So what is emptiness empty of? What is it that Buddha, the four traditional Buddhist schools who have a slightly different perspective on what emptiness is, what is it empty of? It yeah, it or a the self, self, self nature, self. something having a self-existent nature, existing from its so side. But with the four schools of ancient India, they the gacha, which is gacha, which is the thing. We deny, yeah, the thing we say doesn't exist, this self thing, self-existent, there's a slight different interpretation in each of the schools. So, for example, in the Abhidharma school, they say things are dependent arising, dependent on causes and conditions, yeah? So the gacha, the self we deny, is that there would be no tree without water and sunshine and this and that and the other. That would be their gacha. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I want to speed forward, ignore all the other ones, the pirates and everything else, and go to the Majjhimika Prasangika, the highest view, which is what is emptiness empty of? What is the self? What is the gacha? What is the thing we deny? Um, um, uh, self from our own side. A label that inherently applies. Anything that is separate from your mind perceiving and labeling it that way from your projection. Yeah, so we need to understand if he's talking about ultimate body cheetah, if the answer here lies in emptiness, which is the prashna paramita, the perfection of wisdom, we need to see what is he talking about. So we talk about this thing we deny. And there's this three line sentence which the first time I heard it, 
when the Majumikas started explaining, it lost me so much, I'm going to try and ex explain it here. Yeah, so emptiness is... So a common statement that we have, or that the one I heard in originally was, that it's got these three components. Are you your parts? Remember this? Are you the anything other than your parts? And are you the sum of your parts? Remember these three, yeah? So this is a statement to describe emptiness. So what it's saying in a very basic way is, is there a hector that can be found, whatever hector is, is that only in the hand? No. Is that in the part? No, is it in the arm? Can you find hector just here? Can you find hector just here, just here, just here, just here? So we look at the first thing, let's look for an elephant. Can you find an elephant, whatever elephantness is, can you find it in the leg of an elephant? Right? Can you find it in the ear of the elephant only? Right? Individually, the parts of the thing, does that have elephant in it? Does that have hector in it? That's the first thing. Is it in its parts? And the answer is no. No, you can't find that thing in the parts. The second one is a nice, easy, stupid choice. Is it anything other than the parts? In other words, is there a... Sorry, a dirty joke just came up in my mind. I'll take that. <laughs> this is the obstruction I'm talking Is there a Hector? <laughs> is there a Hector in anything other than Hector, like in a flower? Is there, see how it made it pretty? I made the dirty thing pretty. Uh, how is it a Hector in the flower? Yes. You can't find yeah, for you there is yeah. the, there is no hector ness in, the, in anything other than this thing you're calling hector. It's not in anything other than the parts. Correct. Excellent. So we know here are the parts of the elephant: leg, trunk, body, ears. Is it in any of those parts individually? Did we look? Let's look for this thing, right? The answer is no. 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 Okay. Is there an elephant in dog? No. no. Right. And the third one, which is the thing that confused me so much at the beginning, and I think I'm getting the sniff of it now, and I hope I can share that with you. Is it... Is it in the sum of its parts, from the Prasangika point of view, separate from you labeling it that way? So when you grab trunk and ear and head and legs and put it all together and your mind did not label it elephant is that collection of parts elephant yes no. <laughs> <laughs> so if i grabbed an eskimo who's never seen elephant okay and they didn't have the pool of karma or habituated understanding or labeling language to call that particular collection of foot and belly and head and ear and trunk, which we are forced to call elephant together, if we grab someone that never had that and placed it in front of that collection of parts, is that elephant from its own side projecting elephant to everything else? Yes. No. No. Yes. The answer is no. Well, how do you know the answer is no? <laughs> because if because it's written, that's why. No, 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 no because... No, no. Be if I had a bag of elephant parts here, yeah. all right, and I got a big sack, yeah. and you don't know what's in it, and I throw a part over to you, I'm going to throw a leg over in the part. No. Is that an elephant? No, no. No, I throw it in a trunk. No, no. No, I keep throwing parts. Okay, but if when I put it all the parts when together, is it an elephant? When you put all the parts together and they're... But the tail was burnt off years ago. There's no tail to throw you. So I throw those parts. You've got the pile in front of you. When is it an elephant? When I put the parts together, if it, if it still w w moves around. It's a dead elephant. I'm sending you a dead <laughs> elephant. I chopped it up. It's not going to move well, around. Trust me. I don't know, but if it if I could put them together alive, then you it can't. It's a dead elephant. I throw you. If I send you one part of the elephant, even with the tail. You're, you're, this is a silly argument. No, and you don't even believe it, except they want it to be. Remember, it. this, this is about silly. About, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about it later, <laughs> and maybe you'll change your mind. If you make it no, 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 no. I love that you have the objection because <laughs> yeah, it's good. this yeah. is. I'm saying the elephant is a functional system. 
It's the parts working together in a certain way for a certain purpose. So it depends on your mind to label it. Your mind calls it elephant. Your mind does that. Of course, I call it elephant, but I would call it something else if I didn't call it elephant. What if I correct? And that something else is not elephant. Yeah. Yeah. That that's beautiful. You would call it something else. That something else. You might have the same visual grayness because you share redness and the rest, but you would not call it elephant. That's perfect. That's the answer. It doesn't mean there is nothing there. It means the thing that is there is not from its own side what we called it. Whatever you called it, that's from what it is side, for you. Elephant. From its own side, it can't. It doesn't think I'm an elephant. No, no. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's thinking. I like this carrot. So, <laughs> so, but, but I love that you passionately um, debated because if you didn't, then you would be following it because it's words, and it's we shouldn't. We should push and then check. And push. I still don't understand. From its own side, it, it, that doesn't understand English, so why should it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, even from its own side, it doesn't know it's elephant. It's probably looking at us thinking, what are these guys going elephant for all the time? Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but there is nothing in that collection of things, if you were to remove whatever you were forced to call it and whatever it forced to call itself, if you remove that, whatever's left over, it is empty of elephant. It is empty of that ness, that thing. But it is something, it's not nothing. And when and and the Prasangikas, this is the frustrating answer for me. When you go to look for what that thing is, you can't find that either. That's another pain in the butt. But I just want to highlight here that the Buddha is saying to Sabuti, you want to know what these excellent beings that I revere and hold so high, these bodhisattvas, what they should think and do and practice? They should be thinking to turn every living being out of grief. They should they should be thinking this. And if you do, never will you get anybody out of out of here. Meaning, place your mind, Saguti, on the ultimate nature of things. Yeah? This is very important. So where the hell did elephant come from? So I can't leave you hanging that there is nothing there. It's impossible. We must conceive it as something. And this is what I was talking about, the idea of karma. You have no choice but to label that thing in front of you a thing. This is what we are in this realm. And that is karma. If you in your pool of stuff have shitty negative obstruction, if you have beautiful, lovely peace, you will label that thing with those things because you've got nothing else to place on it. Regardless its parts, regardless. So you're saying that we should escape from karma? <laughs> That's lovely. Yes, we should escape from God. Why? Uh, <laughs> no, no, I know, I know, but I'm just uh, <laughs> being in the grips of karma, un uncontrollably, not even knowing that it's karma. Yeah, not knowing how the system functions is what's causing the suffering. The suffering is we don't know causality in the way that it's function that our internal systems are producing elephant and that I like or not like elephant and therefore I act and that my action is not really based on me projecting elephant but my actions are projecting onto I don't like that big great thing stepping on my daffodils so I'm going to kill it and on top of it I'm going to cook it that whole action not understanding where elephant came from is what causes suffering so that that's what I mean so I need to do a couple more things so if you noticed also in the text that I said, he says, he says, anyone at all labeled with the name living being, yeah, labeled with the name living being, anyone at all like that, they're not coming out because he's saying what I just covered. You, you are, we are labeling are forced to label. You're not doing it consciously. I wish the elephant was a tree. You can't, you can't do that. It's, it is what it's forcing you to experience. Unless you're in a, a different realm. So, Excuse me. Mm -hmm. What did you say? Anything labeled is not coming uh, to enlightenment? That's what you said, but I don't understand. Is, is that what I said? I, that's what I heard. I don't know. 
You said anything that you said anything that is labeled a living being. A sentient being. That you should take out of suffering. Anything labeled a human being, you should remove from suffering. So he's talking about understand that you are producing these things called living oh, beings. Because them, then you can't do it. Well, he's saying, in fact, the only reason you can take them is because you're labeling them. If there was a self-existent, the thing we deny, living being who was suffering from its own side, without your mind creating it, you could never fix it. That thing doesn't exist. I don't think the, that's true. The only well, well if that's, you're a doctor and somebody's yeah. suffering, you can help them, right? Temporarily, yeah. That's that's. I'm not saying you can't help things temporarily. Ultimately, in the ultimate sense of that thing that that the doctor saved, that thing's going to get old and sick and die anyway. No doctor can save it at the end. Yeah. So, what we're saying here is that if there were, if they weren't called living beings, you couldn't help them because they would be self-existent, solid, frozen in that state projecting that ness onto everything and no projection of yours can shift it. The fact that there are suffering beings in our perception, in our experience, is the key to the sutra. The, it's, it's the key that you can have an experience of those beings not suffering. Because if it is a label based on the parts, then change the labels. And over time, you are free from perceiving beings as suffering. The Buddha said, what was the first thing the Buddha said? I am all beings. All beings. Well, no. But if you change your perceptions, then you're helping them? Yeah, yeah that's kind of what messes with me. Is he all, like, you know, the Buddha also talks about how, you know, only a Buddha can perceive that thing as, um, empty in that sense, so you're not seeing it as suffering, but at the same time also seeing... So the Buddha having both perceptions, exactly. right? But yeah, uh, I, that used to mess me up so much, because if the Buddha isn't suffering, how the hell is he experiencing me? I'm suffering. Yeah. You know, he can experience my perception of me perceiving myself as suffering. <laughs> yeah, but that is not necessarily to... suffering. So you see a child break their knee, and, and you know that it's going to be okay. Nightmare. A nightmare. Give me, give me an example. Well, if, 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 if a child is having a nightmare, and you're, you're, you're a parent, and you see the child suffering, but you know that that is just an illusion. It's not real. The yeah, child yeah. isn't, isn't, isn't really That's suffering. Nice. It's really just nice. an imagination. Nonetheless, the child's pain is real. It's Even real. though it's an yeah, illusion yeah. that they're suffering from. Oh, that's lovely. So you have compassion and love for that child. You realize the child is deluded, not to, you know, in a crazy way, but it's, it's an imagining. It's not a real thing that they're suffering from. And you have compassion for it, even though there's no real thing that's suffering. And that's the idea that the Bodhisattva has for all beings. That's how they experience it. But that so, way itself doesn't really free them from suffering. No, it, it, if you it could show the it, illusion it shows, later. it shows the path of how they can be free. The only way that they can be free from suffering is from their own mind. There's no magical spell that can be put on somebody that's going to put in their mind and free them. They, the, the Dharma is to awaken them in itself to awaken their minds. That's why we're here. Mm. No, that, I love that. You were going to say something? Yes. Yeah, I've got 10 minutes to do class Just really three. quick. I'll be really yeah. fast. Get on with them. So it's, it's so slow already. Yeah. This, <laughs> <laughs> the, whole, the whole concept of ultimate, what's helped me with that is just being in my meditation and being in my practice where I'm calming the mind because the mind wants to figure all this out. Like we're spending all this time trying to figure yeah. it out. Because the mind is, is not giving up. It's just saying, no, no, it's like little scrubbing bubbles. It's saying, no, nice. I want this and I want this. When in fact, what's helped me a lot is being in a place of, of observing self, which is experiencing my mind. And it's a place of emptiness. And, it, and it's, all, it's not something my mind can really understand. It's not within my mind's purview. It's something that experiences the mind. That's lovely. Look, uh, the, what I've got to say about that is, you know, you, according to the scriptures, thank you for that. that it's beautiful. Because according to the scriptures, you, 
you can't be having any of this blah blah conception in, in the direct perception of emptiness. When you're in the ultimate, right. you, you cannot do it. But here is the trick. Well, we can have the discovery of it by being in the mind and the body. Well, if what we've been talking about is true and things are empty of having inherent existence, and you then come out of that direct perception, regardless if you're a Buddhist, a Hindu, a, a, a being sitting in a rock somewhere, and reality reasserts itself because the mind will begin to, to respond, where does all the labeling come from that you put upon the experience which you couldn't name before? Yeah? So the, the, so the habituating the mind with the, these answers and this discourse, that's why the training and teaching of a specific complete path is a thing in this lineage. Because you could have, beings do have a direct experience of suchness in this world. And they're walking around. But then, <coughs> the only thing they've got to interpret or call that thing which appeared to them is in their collection of karma. It's right. it's their collection of imprints. What it, you, you yeah, see? Yeah, and you said something very beautiful to me a few weeks ago about the arrow. Yeah, it was so close. It's it so close and so close, but it, it can't. Can't touch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to express it? Not in two minutes. Not in eight minutes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I need to do class three. You know, yeah. but I'll I'll do this uh, quickly. But thank you for the discourse. Yeah. yeah. I'm very happy that ACR six is full of this. I think for the passion and the understanding, because I want I want it to be a strong imprint in our minds. It is the only, everything you've been working for will go away. Every beautiful hair stroke, every bit of makeup, every MacBook Pro with a nice cover, everything. <laughs> will, faster RAM, whatever, will go away. You are, we are only ever left with these energies in our consciousness in whatever form we take. So may they be strong. Uh, I'd like to add, you probably covered it, but the person who has seen emptiness directly knows the cause of suffering, the ultimate cause of suffering, and if he knows that the personal true experience, he has great compassion for, he naturally should, will have great compassion for those who don't know it causes of that they're Beautiful. For a couple of reasons. I love, thank you for bringing that up. I'm going to go a little over. Do you mind? I didn't answer your question, but I'm going to do that. <laughs> the, the beautiful thing about that is you naturally do, right? Unless if your, your meditation is off space. Outside. Well, <laughs> they say that eventually you come to the Mahayana track. The, you know, that eventually come to the Bodhisattva track, even if you've been practicing other things. Yeah. Because if you understand that things have no nature of their own, and that the suffering beings you call suffering beings are forced upon you by this pool of impressions that you have in you, called suffering beings, then what you must do to remove suffering from your being, from your experience, is to not act in the way you used to act towards annoying suffering beings. So the only way you could ever free a suffering being, call a being called a suffering being, is understanding that its nature, what you do towards it, <laughs> what the way you're experiencing it is not is is your projection upon it from your poor because that being could be a Buddha, could be a dog, could be a flea, could be an, a bunch of other, it could be an elephant, could be a non-elephant, but it was this suffering being. So when you interact with that, the compassion, the self-interest compassion would come to stop that suffering. The only way you stop that suffering is stop that suffering, understanding emptiness. So that takes me to the next line in the sutra, which we'll do in one minute, and then I'll quickly cover the the bodies of a Buddha. I was going to do a commentary on them, but I'll just touch it just lightly. Yeah. So the next line in the sutra says, or some part later in the sutra, the Buddha says, when a bodhisattva who is not staying gives, 
it is not easy to measure the benefit or the virtue. So he's saying to Subhuti, Subhuti, when a Bodhisattva, like the one that we just explained, the one in ultimate Bodhicitta, yeah? Who is not staying, meaning not staying in self-existence, the deception of self-existence, yeah? Who is not staying in this dualistic world of relative reality. The one that's meditating like you're meditating, yeah? It, when they give, when they do give, or any of the other perfections, yeah, the other five perfections. So this is just an, the Buddha saying, when they do an action like giving, or like patience, or like joyful effort, but he says like giving, it, it is difficult to measure the, how amazing the virtue is. And he says again, how far is it to the left of you? How far is it to the front of you? It is immeasurable. He's saying, when a being gives, or when a bodhisattva who is not staying in the duality of relative existence does an action like give to a suffering being, understanding what I just explained, where do they come from? Their virtue, they're doing it with wisdom, right? With understanding of empty. It is beyond measure. The virtue of that is beyond measure. Why the hell would we say that? Why would it be beyond measure to give with emptiness in your mind than to give zillion planets covered in jewels to someone? Because we give to more because of causing the dependence. I'll do the answer. Because you you understand the root of what that's causing and where that's coming from. You stab ignorance in the heart, yeah. you stop suffering for good. A tiny act of giving with emptiness, understanding the ultimate nature of where reality, the way reality is, will stop at the end, eventually will stop samsara. Well, well, if you give zillion planets of jewels, you will have so much goodness, all like honey on a razor blade necessarily followed by an end. Does it, does it all come from compassion then? Rather than from the mind? It comes from the heart? The mind is the heart in this school. In this school. There is no mind that is not heart in this school. But, but yeah? when you say not staying, he's not going either. If he went, then he couldn't really uh, yes. right? Yeah, he's saying not, but here he refers to, according to, this is what's amazing about having the Tibetan commentary. He's explained that not staying means not staying in the grasping of self-existence. So this is what's awesome about having Lama, I forgot his name, Chuchu, Chonya Lama, yeah? Explain what the word not stay means. Because there's another idea about not staying is don't leave to Nirvana and stay. Yeah, correct. So now I've got to explain. Uh, 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 uh. <coughs> so the effects of wisdom is immeasurable compared to the effects of nominal giving. That's really what he's saying there. Um, and then the Buddha says to Subhuti. So tell me, Subhuti, again to prove the point about relative and ultimate nature. If you were to meet a being with the 32 sign, 32 marks and 80 signs of an enlightened being, and that's another whole story, there is a definite set of 32 signs that an enlightened being will have or will perceive themselves to have, and they're correlated to specific karmas that they do, blah, and 80 signs, like the shape of their nose is one of them and the color of their skin perceive etc if you were to see one like that would you well they if you were to meet someone like that would you say that they are a buddha would you consider them to be a buddha so but if you met somebody with 32 signs and 80 32 marks and 80 signs like it's written everywhere that a Buddha and Lightning would have these things, and that's another field of study. So, Buddha, if you saw someone like that, would you call them a Buddha? Would you say they are a Buddha? And so, Buddha goes, no. 
because he knows that he's being tricked into the relative <laughs> ultimate thing. Because no, I wouldn't call him a Buddha. It's very good Subhuti. Yeah, very, very good Subhuti. So then, I need to tell you about the Rupakaya, which is the first two bodies. Sometimes the bodies of the Buddha can be divided into two, into three, or into four. I'm going to give you the division of all four, so then you can have an argument with anyone about if they say, oh, there's four bodies, no, no, it's just two. And then like, uh, so you can just debate, yeah? So the Rupakaya uh, is the Rupa is uh, form and Kaya is body, so the form body. So you are made up of your physical body and your mental body. And body here doesn't mean body, it means parts. If you think about the translation of Kaya, it's not a body, but like a body of water. It's like a chunk of something. Yeah. So here you could say part. So the first division is the Rupakaya, which is the physical body, which is mostly brought about by... Karma. Yeah, virtue. Right? Like if it's a good karma, it'd be virtue. Good. So the truku, what's a truku? Have you heard the word truku in Tibetan? Is yeah, yeah, it's like a, you go to a reincarnation and they're a truko, right? The real meaning of truko is the emanation body. The body emanating as something. Like, so the idea of emanating means what? The real one isn't there, right? It's like a data projector projecting. So it's emanating a body over there. So the real truko would be Chakimuni Buddha's body in... Uh, on earth, one would say, Mahayanas would say. Um, that would be the Nirmanakaya. The next one is Longku, say Longku, and that is the enjoyment body or the Sambhogakaya. And basically, what that means is the Buddha in their own paradise experiencing themselves as the way they experience themselves. This is uh, their enjoyment body, their, uh, the way I think about it is that they're having fun in their paradise, right, their enjoyment, they're having, they are sitting there with certain beings who can also perceive them in the way they perceive themselves, so with the retinue of arias mostly and bodhisattvas. <coughs> this, mm, what you said, Nirmanakaya emanation body, does that mean all of us are emanation bodies? Uh, actually, that's interesting that you should say that because <coughs> in some uh, indigenous communities, you can have a, what they would call an Ramanaka, an emanation body, where your consciousness might be in meditation, and then you would see yourself a spirit bird or something like this. And in that respect, the Tibetans agree that it is possible to have that uh, capacity in, in samsara, like what you use it for and how it's useful is another story, but it's the same idea. There's two types of uh, truku uh, or emanation bodies. One is the real one, which is the one that the Buddha used to be here, and the other one it might be the Buddha can project into three kinds of emanation bodies. One which would be a human, an <coughs> animal, or an inanimate object, and so that that means when it's ripe and conditions are right when your karma is ready and then the deer ran in front of you and you didn't kill the squirrel uh, you could say that virtue is the body of a, uh, the work of a Buddha's emanation body I don't want to get into that because I've got two minutes I see your face going all right <laughs> yeah and I don't think it's the point of it either the point here is to say the Buddha will go on again and again and saying, anybody that's got these 32 signs that you call a Buddha, is that really a Buddha, Subhuti? Yeah? So then we go about well, what makes up a Buddha. There's a form body. So the form of the Buddha has the emanation body, what it's projecting in whatever world has, and the... And the... Sorry. The two parts of the Rupakaya. Enjoyment body, which is the, the way they see themselves in their paradise. And then they have their wisdom bodies, which is their Dharmakaya. Right? Yeah, the Rupakaya is a combination of, of the Rupakaya and the Sambhogakaya? Is that what you say? No. What did you say? It's the Rupakaya. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, is, I that did, is what I did. Said. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, the easiest way is to say Rupakaya, Sambhogakaya, and it's just like you. You have a physical form and a mental form. Yeah. So the Dharmakaya is the collection or the sum up of all the mental forms of the Buddha, and there's a division of two. So the first one, Nawa Niku, is the essence body. This is the Savabakaya. 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 What it means, it is. This is the emptiness of the other three bodies, and not a thing to be spending lots of time on. This. This is Zogchen body. No, this I don't know enough about Sokjin actually, but this is what uh, this has two parts. One part is the one that that we would call your Buddha nature, which is the emptiness of the Buddha's mind and the emptiness of your mind are the same part when you become a Buddha is when you not become a Buddha, but that's, I don't want to get into that yet. And the other part of that mind is the cessation part, i.e. the mind that's stopped believing in Santa Claus or stopped ignorance, yeah? So like your mind has the cessation of Santa Claus, the Buddha's has, the Buddha's, this part of the Buddha's mind has cessation of ignorance and uh, mental afflictions. The last one, the Janana Dharmakaya is the wisdom body, mm, which is really his omniscient mind. Mm -hmm. So, so let's. Would you say the first Dharmakaya is the ordinary Dharmakaya and his Janana? The Dharmakaya is in the division of four, is the, men, is the wisdom body, and it has two parts in the division of four. But sometimes people say Nirmanakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Dharmakaya. Yeah. So you don't have to go Janana Dharmakaya, yeah? yeah? Which is the way it's divided into the four. It, I just need you to know them and because... And there's also some Swamraga that's, that's one of the... That's the first one, Nawa Nawa Kiku. That's the Swababa First, The first part of the... Of the Dharmakaya, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So... The reason I went into the explanation of this is because the Buddha asked Sabuti, if you see this creature that's got all these signs, all these forms, all these bodies, do you call them a Buddha? They are Buddha. Because we just had the argument about whether or not they're really sentient beings. So smarten up and we can get on with the teaching. And Sabuti goes, no. So what's the point of understanding these different bodies of the Buddha, how he would perceive himself, how others perceive him, how he's projecting, how he's not projecting, how he's divided into form. How, so the form of the body is really the result of the collection of merit and all the activity. And the Dharmakaya is the result of all the wisdom and all the emptiness meditations and all the in, or the mind thing that we have, or the compassion that you build, etc. So to sum it up, I'll go really quickly and then uh, we can figure out whether I missed any homework questions next week. It's really, he's saying to Subhuti that if you, are, if you are holding to any self-existent whatsoever, because he repeats himself that there is no such marks, he repeats it twice, and the first time he says it not deceptively, and the second time he's saying, it's not even your mind conceiving of your mind as mind. Because this movement of consciousness that you have, that you call the mind, that is also empty. And that shift of <coughs> things you call ideas, sensations, whatever it is, it doesn't have a nature of mind. And, and you could 
be seeing yourself not experiencing suffering beings in the way that you are conceiving of them, including yourself as seeing yourself in this play altogether. So the next part of the sutra, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about if you really considered whatever you think your mind is as having any nature, you have to consider that this projection of movement or dots or things that you are calling mind can't possibly, like an elephant, be called mind from its own side. And and then the, so and then this is the, the teaching that's really deep. So this is why the beginning of the sutra is that this is a Mahayana Sutra, like it's not for any lesser vehicle practitioners. It's like saying you have to be prepared to deconstruct your world without going to the two extremes of nothing exists at all and things exist fully and only in the way I experience them. And if you are playing in that field, we had a chat about that just before, your mind and the way you consider the movement of your mind as mind is also in that category. You could be having a complete different set of experiences upon this same data that's here, including the data perceiving the data. And I'll, I want to leave it there for tonight. They're different dharmas, but this is the, uh, the Buddha's dharma, the Buddha dharma. Yeah, this, this is, is the Buddha's dharma. This one. Mm. Thank you. So let's do a beautiful dedication. Some of us have um, <coughs> encountered some obstructions in our path. Some of you have some suffering close by. Some of you have some potential that's mm, coming or going. I'll invite you to dedicate to other people in the room who might have things they need to fix, any goodness that came out of today. So forget yourself for a second and think, imagine if there are beings in the room who just need goodness more than you do and give it away to them. Um, Javier, you want to talk to it? <laughs>